Good evening to all. Happy to welcome all of you to the today's event. Uh, DC Kirikamuri commemorate your oration by Sri Jairam Ramesh on the topic economic impact assessment. DC Books is celebrating the 46th anniversary. DC Books was started in 1974 by DC Kirikamuri. Ever since his death, uh, we have been having the commemorative oration. The first uh, commemorative oration was done in 1999, August 29, by none other than the then Prime Minister, earlier former Prime Minister, uh, P.V. Narasim Harau. Today, uh, on the 22nd uh, commemorative oration, we have uh, Sri Jairam Damesh uh, to discuss on the one of the most relevant topics now, economic impact environment impact assessment. Uh, Sri Jairam Ramesh is an economist, member of parliament, former minister for environment and forest. He has graduated from IIT Mumbai in mechanical engineer. Post that, he did his master of science in public policy and public management from Carnegie Mellon University. And while he was doing his doctoral program in Massachusetts Institute of Technology, he was forced to come back to India for uh, uh, his personal as well as a career reasons, actually. Uh, today, uh, on the environment impact assessment, uh, I guess uh, we have a lot of a lot of debates that have been happening in the last few months, rather. Will the boom for the industry be the recom for the environment protect, pro, protection in, initiatives of India or with EIA will environment regulations be weakened. We are all quite a lot of apprehend, apprehension on the government move to implement it rather quickly. Will the new rules enable post facto approval of violations and is it going to be a, a doom for the environment as well? So Jairam Damesh is going to talk on the topic and let me invite Sri Jairam Damesh once again, thank you, sir, for come, being a part of the 20, uh, DC Kerkemari commemorative oration. And we welcome you to the uh, anniversary celebrations as well. Thank, thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, my friend, Ravi, DC. First of all, I am delighted, I'm privileged, I'm honored uh, to give this 22nd Dominic Chako Kilakemuri, I hope. I've got the right. pronunciation right. Absolutely. Okay. right. <laughs> Thank you. I had to practice it quite a lot. <laughs> who, uh, who was quite, who was a sensation and who is a legend in the field of uh, publishing, particularly Malayalam literature. Uh, earlier this year in February, uh, I was in Kochi uh, to address uh, and speak at a literary festival uh, organized by the SPCS the Cooperative Society, uh, of which um, uh, Mr. Dominic Chako Kilakemuri was uh, the founder. Uh, so in many ways, um, he is uh, a very important figure uh, in the history of Malayalam publishing. Uh, and his son, Ravi, has kept up that tradition. Uh, of course, uh, Kerala is the most literate, most conscious, uh, most aware society that we have in our country, uh, you know, newspapers, books, poetry. In fact, I'm just completing a book. Uh, it is a, it's a biography of a poem that was written uh, in 1879 on the life of Gautam Buddha. Uh, and it was translated into Malayalam amongst the earliest translations of that book, of that epic poem. The Light of Asia by Sir Edwin Arnold uh, was into Malayalam. And two of the greatest names of Malayalam poetry, um, Nalapattu Madmenan and uh, Kumaran Asan, uh, have both translated and others also have translated. So uh, Malayalam is, uh, is, is lit rich literature, Kerala society, a very uh, reader friendly, reader conscious society. And so I'm delighted to be giving this oration in the name of a legendary figure in the history of Malayalam publishing. 
Uh, I've been asked to speak on the environment impact notification, which has been in the news, which has evoked a lot of concern and comment across the country. Uh, but let's just step back for a minute uh, and see what has been happening over the last uh, few years when the priority, the mantra is ease of doing business. Uh, what has happened is the National Green Tribunal that was set up by an act of parliament in 2010 has been systematically weakened. Uh, what has happened is that coal mines in rich forest areas have been opened up for mining and auction. What has happened is pollution norms for thermal power stations near urban areas have been loosened. Uh, what has happened is that uh, the privatization of forest land, the doors are being opened for the privatization uh, of, uh, of degraded forest land, uh, particularly. Uh, and so generally, there has been uh, a feeling that has gained ground in the government that uh, environment is a regulatory hurdle. It's a bottleneck. It's a speed breaker. Uh, and therefore, we need uh, to loosen them, weaken them, if not totally eliminate them. We have fundamentally six laws in our country. Uh, you know, going back to 1972, we had the Wildlife Protection Act in 1972. We had the Water Pollution Control Act in 1974. We had the Forest Conservation Act in 1980. We had the Air Pollution Control Act in 1981. We had the Environment Protection Act in 1986, uh, and then we had the Forest Rights Act in 2006. These are the six laws that govern uh, protection of the environment and forests and wildlife and biodiversity. Of course, we also have uh, in 2002, we had the Biodiversity Act. So there are basically seven acts that govern the protection of, uh, of natural heritage in our country. Uh, as generally speaking, uh, ours is a culture, ours is a tradition, ours has been a civilization which respects nature. Western culture, Western civilization has been based on man's conquest of nature, whereas Indian civilizations, whether it is Buddhist or whether it's Hindu or Jain, uh, has, been, uh, has been generally one, and later, of course, both Islam and Christianity, which became part of Indian society, uh, they've all operated on the assumption that we can live on harmony with nature. We respect mountains, we respect forests, we respect wildlife. Uh, and therefore, you know, protection of the environment is not something that should be alien to our ethos. We have been brought up in this ethos. Uh, we have gods, we have goddesses, uh, we venerate our natural resources. But in the name of development, we have forgotten our traditions, we have forgotten our heritage, our cultural heritage. Uh, and over many years, uh, the ecological imbalance uh, has crept in. The frequency with which we have natural disasters in our country has increased. And that is a direct consequence uh, of man's intervention with nature. In fact, there is an old Sanskrit uh, saying, uh, which is very relevant, prakriti rakshati rakshataha, nature protects those who protect it. You disturb nature, nature hits back at you. You protect nature, nature looks after you. And in many ways, this COVID-19 crisis, uh, of course, it is a public health crisis. But fundamentally, deep down, it's an ecological crisis. It's a crisis born out of the manner in which man uh, across the world has dealt with nature. Uh, and we are facing the consequences of that. So I think, uh, uh, you know, this is a useful background to have uh, when we look at the environment impact uh, notification, assessment notification, the EIA notification that has been issued, that derives its powers from the Environment Protection Act. And fundamentally, what this notification does is carries forward this philosophy of ease of doing business uh, and uh, brings about 
proposes to bring about it's not yet it's not yet finalized it's not yet announced it's still under discussion but it proposes to bring about fundamental changes uh, in the manner we look at environment regulation first of all it's deeply anti democratic it reduces the scope for public hearings it reduces the scope for environmental impact assessment and it introduces this dangerous concept of post facto approval which is basically you set up a project uh, you plead ignorance uh, you pay a penalty uh, and regularize uh, that environmental violation uh, so this is deeply anti democratic no longer are local communities uh, a will be able uh, to bring to the government's attention uh, violations of laws no longer will civil society organizations and ngos highlight environmental failures and environmental violations only government departments government agencies will have the power to do so so fundamentally it's anti democratic it is reducing the space for the public it is reducing the space for civil society uh, and uh, uh, it it is severely severely undermining the democratic basis of environmental decision making environment is not a technocratic exercise to be carried out in closed rooms environment uh, affects livelihoods if it affects the daily lives of people and the people should be involved uh, in the management of their resources whether it's land whether it's water whether it's forests whether it's mountain you know people have to be involved and what this draft eia notification 2020 does uh, it severely reduces the role of the public the second uh, aspect which is uh, equally important which uh, has not got the attention it deserves is uh, uh, today environment uh, has become a severe serious public health issue uh, pollution water pollution air pollution chemical contamination uh, these are all have public health consequences climate change has a public health consequence we public health measured both in terms of morbidity as well as in terms of mortality uh, and therefore we cannot look at environment in isolation from public health in fact what we are seeing in covid-19 as i mentioned to you it's a public health crisis the other side of which uh, is an environmental crisis so there is a very close relationship a close nexus between the environment and public health uh, between 2000 and 2015 some estimates are that anywhere between 8 to 10% of the deaths that took place in india uh, over a 15 year period was directly attributable to air pollution uh, i'm talking of deaths but uh, the morbidity the incidence of cardiovascular diseases the incidence of asthma for example uh, amongst children and the younger population has grown very significantly on account of air pollution water pollution is a long term killer chemical contamination we have seen uh, of course bhopal uh, in december 1984 uh, was the uh, was the worst example and it is that bhopal tragedy the catastrophe that resulted in the environment protection act of 1986 so this draft eia notification by exempting a large number of economic activities from uh, the ambit of environmental impact assessment is going to have a very serious Uh, effect on public health and uh, morbidity and mortality both in the short run as well as in the long run so not only is it anti democratic in reducing the role of the public but it's also anti public health because uh, of the of the of the large exemptions it is giving uh, to environmental impact assessment and also because uh, as i have mentioned earlier the post facto approval provision thirdly uh, it's a notification it's a notification that is uh, brought out by uh, the government 
by the central government. Uh, now, environment is a shared responsibility. Uh, one thing that uh, the COVID-19 has taught us mm -hmm. is that we need local governments. We need strong local governments. We need strong local communities. In fact, the reason why Kerala is held out as a, as a relatively successful model uh, of COVID management is because of social capital, because of uh, the strong uh, bonds of community and local institutions. So you need uh, environment, uh, the management of the environment, you need the central government, you need the state government, you need, most importantly, local governments completely involved. But uh, I'm afraid in the draft EIA notification, you have extreme centralization of powers and the central government is taking upon itself the powers to appoint even state level environmental impact assessment authorities, which has never been the case so far. Fourthly, uh, any notification derives its power from a law. This draft EIA notification is based on the Environment Protection Act of 1986. Now, it's a fundamental rule, it's an obvious rule, that you cannot have a notification that violates the mother law. How can you have a notification, which is after all, a noti notification is not something that is approved by parliament. Laws are approved by parliament. Notifications are issued by governments based on the law that has been passed by parliament. But here is an example of a law that of a notification that exceeds the law uh, that has been passed by parliament. This is truly extraordinary. It's never happened before. Uh, normally what happens is that uh, laws get passed and powers are delegated uh, to the government of the day. And the government of the day then ensures that what is promulgated in the notification does not exceed the law from which it derives its powers. But I'm afraid in the case of the draft EIA notification, the notification itself exceeds the law. And therefore, it's bound to get struck down in the courts. So in short, the draft EIA notification is anti-democratic because it reduces the public's role. It's anti-public health because it exempts a whole slew of economic activities from environmental impact assessment. It's anti-decentralization because it centralizes power with the union government. Uh, and fourthly, it's anti-jurisprudence because the notification exceeds <clears throat> the powers, the ambits of the main law from which it is derived. But you must understand that this notification is not a surprise. It's, as I mentioned to you, part of a governing philosophy, part of a mindset. And uh, we pay lip service uh, to the environment. But when it comes to the crunch, we are not uh, able to muster up the courage to take decisions to protect the environment. The type of decision, for example, that was taken in 1983 to protect Silent Valley in Kerala by the late Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, which to my mind, probably amongst the most courageous decisions ever taken to protect an ecosystem, a critical ecosystem. So I think what we need to recognize is <clears throat> the very nature uh, of uh, thinking mm -hmm. on the environment has undergone a change. The environment minister now gets up in parliament and says, I have cleared 3,000 projects. I have cleared 4,000 projects. He does not get up and say, I have protected the air, or I have protected forests, or I have protected animals, or I have protected ecosystems. He gets up and says, I have cleared projects. And I think that is a gross abdication of responsibility. The dharma of the environment minister <clears throat> is to protect the environment, mm -hmm. is not to clear environment projects. It, the dharma of the environment minister is to enforce environmental laws without fear, without favor, 
because once you have laws, your job is to ensure that these laws are enforced both in letter as well as in spirit. Now, over the last couple of months, uh, there's been widespread public concern, something like 20 lakh public representations have gone in uh, to the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change. I don't know, frankly, uh, what the government is going to do uh, because they don't need, as I said, parliamentary approval. Large number of state governments have also protested, have also written and expressed their concerns. Large number of political parties also have done so. Uh, and I can only hope that the government uh, will be sensitive to uh, the, what the public is saying. But its track record uh, on managing the environment, unfortunately, does not give me much confidence. They say one thing, uh, the Prime Minister particularly, uh, poses as the great champion of the environment internationally, but he does not walk the talk. When it comes to actual action, uh, you know, um, you are still seeing large number of projects and the Western Ghats itself is a classic example of the manner in which on the one hand we say the Western Ghats is crucial and on the other we keep clearing mining projects construction projects, railway projects, highway projects, uh, which uh, are going to endanger the ecosystem. Recently, you must have been reading in the newspapers about the Chardham project in Uttarakhand. Again, a recipe for ecological uh, devastation and damage. So I think uh, we, we are at a crossroads. India requires faster economic growth. Uh, we need to revive the economy, but we cannot revive the economy by uh, putting all environmental laws in cold storage because that will be shooting ourselves in the foot. These environmental laws exist not only to protect the environment, but they also exist to protect us, to protect our public health uh, and to ensure that pollution, contamination, deforestation, global warming, uh, do not have adverse impacts on livelihoods in our public health. So I think we must recognize that climate change is a reality. It's not. It's not a theor. It's not a some theoretical construct uh, of the Western world. It's a reality. Our monsoons have become more unpredictable. Our glaciers are retreating. Our forests are losing uh, the biodiversity. The, our sea levels are rising. Uh, and in the face of such firm, conclusive, incontrovertible evidence of climate change already being a reality, I think it will be suicidal on our part uh, to uh, weaken all laws relating to the environment, whether they relate to wildlife, whether they relate to forests, whether they relate to the protection of coastal areas uh, or whether they relate uh, to, uh, you know, environmental impact assessment like this draft EIA notification does. Uh, the public is concerned and I know people in Kerala particularly uh, who are very conscious of nature, uh, they are also concerned. Large number of organizations have raised their educational organizations Social activists, political organizations have raised their voice. And I think uh, this is uh, in the spirit of democracy that people's voices uh, are being heard. And I do hope uh, that the government will heed uh, these concerns. But we are at a very critical juncture. Uh, there is no doubt about the fact that this crisis has long been in coming. Uh, we are facing with uh, a very ser serious, a fundamental ecological crisis and the traditional economic model that we have, grow now, pay later. We have growth for 20 years and we deal with the consequences of that economic growth. We pay for that economic growth later is simply not sustainable anymore. We need economic growth, but not at the cost of the environment. 
We need environmental protection as much as we need jobs, as we need investment, as we need infrastructure. And I think India has a unique opportunity of showing to the world a different model, a model that is not based on the traditional Western model, which even the Chinese have adopted, which is grown out pay later. Uh, and I think we should learn uh, from experience. This COVID-19 uh, is a time for reflection, uh, is a time to put the pause button. And when we put press the play button again, uh, we should not be playing on the same track. Uh, we should be playing on a different track. And that track uh, is ecological balance. That track is environmental protection. Uh, and that track is green growth. Everybody talks of GDP. Uh, GDP should not be gross domestic product. GDP must be green domestic product. How far we are able to internalize issues relating to the protection of the environment in the process of economic growth is the biggest challenge that we have. So let me once again thank my good friend Ravi DC, uh, who's been a very valued friend, who's given me many opportunities uh, of uh, speaking to various audiences, both in India and abroad. It's a unique privilege for me uh, to be here, to be speaking uh, in memory, in honor uh, of a one truly uh, a remarkable figure in the history of Malayalam publishing. Uh, I, I can do no better than to salute his memory, to applaud his contributions. Uh, and I look forward to working with so many people in Kerala, particularly uh, with whom I have had a very intimate association. Uh, uh, although I, I often say that I am part Malayali myself, I'm not able to pronounce Malayalam words uh, you know, with the with uh, with the ease that I should have, and I plead guilty for that. But uh, Kerala is indeed one of my favorite destinations. Uh, my recent book, uh, A Checkered Brilliance, is on one of the great sons of Kerala, one of the great sons of India, Vengalil Krishnan Krishna Menon, V K Krishna Menon, who came from Kolikod, uh, and I'm glad to say that. Uh, uh, Matrabhumi Books is bringing out the Malayalam version of that biography sometime uh, at the end of this year. So let me wish all of you a uh, very safe uh, next couple of weeks and months. Uh, I hope uh, that we are going to see the worst behind us. Most importantly, I hope we learn the appropriate lessons uh, and not repeat the mistakes of the past not look at environmental protection as a luxury, but as a necessity, as something that is absolutely essential for our health, for our democracy, for our livelihoods. Thank you very much. And uh, that brings to the end of the conversation because it's a stream yard and uh, it's going live in different other platforms, actually Instagram to uh, YouTube to uh, Facebook. And uh, once again, I thank uh, Sri Jairam Ramesh for being a part of the oration and uh, this is being widely uh, circulated through the social media otherwise. Uh, once again, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi.